morning, uh, good afternoon, and good night, depending on where, where you are, and, and welcome to this IA uh, webinar today. Um, this session is going to be uh, lasting about an hour and a half, and uh, we are going to be delving into a specific analysis on the opportunities, but also the challenges for the uh, transport sector, and in particular, the long distance transport uh, modes, how to contribute to clean energy transitions uh, in the context of the uh, work and the analysis that was recently released from the IA on the 2020 edition of the energy technology uh, perspectives. Uh, first, let me perhaps thanks uh, all of you um, as well for uh, providing input and uh, valuable information for us to be able to complete uh, this, this report. And our engagement with most of the uh, colleagues uh, joining this webinar has been instrumental really to, to complete the, um, the project. Um, just very quickly, uh, let me introduce myself. Uh, I'm Felipe Fernandez. I'm coordinating the end use activities uh, in the technology division, and particularly in the context of this of this project. So I'll moderate the the session uh, today, and uh, and the Q and A uh, in particular at the end of the of the webinar. Uh, we are going to structure the webinar into into blocks. Uh, the first one would be a presentation where. My colleagues uh, Jacob Titer and Jacopo Tatini, who are representing the uh, technology transport team, uh, who is also joining the session today, would be uh, providing all the details of this analysis uh, in this particular area. And then we'll have a session on for Q and A, so responding to some of the questions you will be raising. Uh, that would last around 30 minutes. So please uh, put uh, on post all the questions you may have throughout the discussion uh, and the session in the in the chat box, and we'll be. Uh, structuring them towards the end, so we'll be uh, hopefully be able to respond all of this uh, in that session. Otherwise, we'll be getting back to you afterwards. Um, with that, let me just put a bit of quick context on the different activities and the analysis that has been released uh, this year, in particular from the technology division, which would be relevant for the um, for the transport uh, sector. Starting with a report uh, on clean energy innovation that was released. Uh, in early uh, July, and in which we've quantified the, uh, the needs for clean energy innovation, in particular for a transition towards net zero emissions. Um, and we followed that with the full, uh, let's say, uh, uh, spectrum of uh, details on the transition uh, in the addition of energy technology perspectives in early September uh, this year, where we've basically released the full uh, scenarios, the analysis and discussions around that uh, for a transition towards net zero emissions. And uh, these two kind of, uh, let's say, products uh, were accompanied as well by a tool that we've uh, called a Clean Energy Technology Guide, in which, um, as well, is available on our website um, at complete extent. And there we've explored more than 400 technologies uh, across different uh, sectors and the whole energy system, looking at what uh, is their uh, technology readiness when it comes to commercial uh, deployment. Um, and there's additional information related to each of these, uh, of these items to try to guide the users into how, uh, let's say, intense the activities related to innovation for this uh, are at the moment. Um, also in early October, there was another special report from the division uh, and focusing on clean energy technologies uh, for uh, the CCUS family in this, in this case, uh, looking at the role of these uh, technology family in different areas of the, of the system and the strategic a value that it could have in these energy transitions. But beyond this kind of, uh, let's say, more horizontal uh, type of products, uh, there was also uh, the regular edition, of course, of the Global AV Outlook uh, that was released uh, in spring. Um, and again, looking at the, the latest prospects um, and uh, projections, discussions on the electrification for the transport sector. Um, beyond this, uh, there was a full menu of uh, individual articles, commentaries that were released by different colleagues in the team that basically looked at uh, different uh, prospects, uh, market analysis, but also uh, technology views uh, that are relevant for, again, for the transportation uh, sector. And also there was a, an update and a new edition of the Tracking Clean Energy Progress, uh, which is, again is a more kind of cross-cutting and horizontal product of the IEA, but that also covers specific uh, areas, uh, modes, and technologies of the transportation sector that is also available on our on our website. So, with this, I'm gonna uh, pass it on to my colleague uh, Jacopo Tatini, who is gonna go into the first uh, component of our presentation. Thanks. Many thanks, Sarah Sally. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone, depending on where you're based. Uh, I'm Jacopo Tatini. I'm a uh, transport analyst 
in the Energy Technology and Policy Division. So without further delay, I will uh, start presenting some of the key insights in uh, Energy Technology Perspectives 2020, which analyzes the role that technologies and innovation will need to play to ensure a rapid and cost-effective transition towards the carbonized energy system, while ensuring security supply and affordable energy prices. In this revamped edition of the Energy Technology Perspectives, we have focused in particular on technology opportunities for the so-called heart of eight sectors, such as iron and steel, cement and chemicals in industry, and the heavy duty trucks, shipping and aviation in transport. Next slide, please. As of today, more than 125 governments worldwide have formally discussed net zero emission targets. And over a dozen countries, including the European Union, uh, accounting for more than 10% of global CO2 emissions, have formulated their emissions in law or proposed legislation. But an indication of how dynamic things are lies in the fact that at the time of the publication of ETP 2020, China, Japan, and South Korea had not yet announced their ambition to achieve net zero emissions, as you can see in this figure. Similarly, many companies have also pledged to reach net zero emissions as early as 2050 in order to improve our chances of limiting the temperature rise to an average of less than 1.5 degrees. But the actual technology needs, opportunities, and challenges to support them still need to be understood. And ETP 2020 evaluates these technology needs and opportunities uh, and also the policy requirements to do that, answering questions such as how can we reach the decarbonization targets? Uh, what are the sectors and the technologies that will be crucial to reach um, the net zero emissions? Um, well, to reach the, this climate ambition, we need to reduce our energy and industry related CO2 emissions by around 35 gigatons in 2070, relatively to the policies that we currently have in place. The obvious place to start is uh, the power sector, which today contributes to around 40% of energy rated CO2 emissions and is composed of an asset with a very long lifetime. Recent progress in the cost reduction and penetration of renewable electricity gives hope that decarbonizing the power sector is going to be central to achieving the climate goals. But uh, decarbonizing power generation by itself is not enough to fulfill our climate goals. And the power sector contributes to only one third of the reductions to net zero emissions in 2070. The story is similar for electric cars. Any pathway to, need zero emission, to, to reach uh, net zero emissions will need to build on their recent success. But electrifying passenger cars alone is of course not sufficient to bring us to net zero emissions. This is because emissions from the energy sector are much broader than that. Industry, transport and building sectors together make up for approximately 55% of energy and industry related CO2 emissions today. And it's obvious uh, that the pace of their transition is at the core of the challenge. Uh, for some areas of the energy sector, such as uh, long distance transport uh, and the heavy industry, the availability of clean energy technologies is somehow limited today. And we still need to innovate in order to bring the required technologies to the market. The transition to net zero emissions, as many governments, corporates, industries have pledged, is not viable without a strong innovation push. And this is one of the main findings, that the key messages of ETP 2020. Um, you can see that the cumulative contribution from technologies, next please, uh, from technologies that are, at, uh, that are mature today, such as hydropower, nuclear, electric trains, is fairly limited, about 25% um, of the total. And this is because they're set to play a role for our energy future already under the existing policies. A heavy burden rests on technologies that are currently at um, early stage of adoption and for which improved design and stronger policy support is still needed. And these account for approximately 40% of the total. Um, this uh, set of technologies includes technologies in advanced adolescence, such as electric cars, and technologies that are still smaller in fans, such as hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. Technologies that uh, today are at demonstration level deliver around one sixth of the cumulative uh, emission savings. 
Uh, this played a particular role in heavy industry and long distance transport. Examples here include CO2 capture uh, at cement plants and large electric ships. And many of the technologies that are needed to decarbonize these sectors are even at a stage where only the first large prototypes are being developed today. Think, for instance, of uh, hydrogen-based steel and air, air capture, for, for example. If we want to reach net zero emissions within the next five decades, then we need to shield clean energy innovation from any possible disruption. In the sustainable development scenario, we assume that all critical energy technologies that are currently at demonstration or large prototype um, stage reach the market within the next five years, sorry, the next decade. Um, in this report, we have also looked at technology innovation needed to get to net zero by 2050. And we did that in a scenario that is called fast innovation case, but we will not cover it in that presentation. If you have questions, we are welcome to take them and to reply in the Q&A session later on. But in the rest of this presentation, we will share with you some of the key findings of the analysis of ETP 2020 on the transport sector. We will start answering uh, this question, how can each transport mode contribute to achieving net zero emissions by 2070? Um, in this is just uh, to provide some context, in the sustainable development scenario, mobility per capita measured as uh, passenger kilometers travel doubles be between today and 2070 as a consequence of rising prosperity and uh, population. And at the same time, global car ownership rises by 60%. Two and three wheelers have a strong electrification case. Since the lifetime of these vehicles is rarely more than 10 years, with new sales of uh, two and three wheelers having completely electrified in the 2030s, operational CO2 emissions can get near zero by 2040. Rail, uh, the rail sector is uh, another mode where CO2 emissions can be cut rapidly, primarily by electrifying the trains. And uh, virtually all the existing lines get electrified by the mid-2050s. Uh, mid but the emissions from the small stock of rarely used diesel locomotives can also be gradually replaced by batteries and fuel cells. Like commercial vehicles uh, switch rapidly to electric and to electricity, and later on also incorporate fuel cells, sometimes just to supplement onboard energy storage in cases where longer ranges are needed. Uh, here we see that large logistic services are in an ideal position to tailor their fleet portfolios um, by using big data analytics, uh, tracking and optimizing the operations uh, and energy capacity and charging of their fleet. Moreover, since a high utilization of the fleet accelerates the payback of the additional upfront cost that uh, any, any purchaser has to, to do when purchasing electric vehicles, uh, thanks to that, lead commercial vehicles are set to electrify even faster than privately owned cars. And what happens to cars? Um, cars are expected to experience the biggest fall in CO2 emissions already between now and 2040 because electric vehicles make a rapid headway. Besides that, also hybrid and plug-in hybrids play a significant transitional role. Uh, electric buses and minibuses, which you can see here in light blue, are getting, are getting increasingly chosen by municipal fleet operators because of their benefits on air quality and financing schemes. Um, plus also the fact that uh, the upfront investment can be paid back through lower fuel and maintenance cost. By 2070, about two thirds of the buses are battery electric and one quarter, mainly intercity buses that cover longer distances, will be powered by hydrogen. Finally, there are three modes that don't reach net zero emissions, but the, yeah, don't reach zero emissions by 2070. And these are heavy trucks, ships and airplanes. A major challenge to reduce emissions in these subsectors lies in the fact that low and zero carbon technologies here are not yet commercial. Think about ammonia in ships or sustainable biojet and synthetic kerosene for, for aviation. Um, in these hard to abate sectors, about three quarters of the cumulative emissions uh, reductions 
come from technologies that today are just at demonstration scale or even only at prototype level. What are the implications of uh, this transformation that we are highlighting and discussing in the transport sector on low carbon fuels? And here we are looking across all the whole transport, not just some modes. Well, gasoline, which here is represented in gray, uh, reduces the share of total transport fuel mix from 40% today to virtually zero in 27. Gasoline uh, today is mostly consumed by light duty vehicles, such as two and three wheelers, uh, light commercial vehicles, um, cars, and sometimes also urban buses. And here, electric vehicles penetrate rapidly. And as we saw in the previous slide, by 2070, essentially all light duty vehicles have bridged have bridge to zero emission vehicles and most electric drive. Heavy duty is a different story because here the destination fuels are both hydrogen and electricity, depending on the duty cycle and the <coughs> operations. But uh, the transition to zero emission vehicle powertrains in long distance heavy duty lags behind light duty vehicle by approximately one decade. And because of that, by 2070, there will be still some heavy duty trucks in stock that consume diesel. Uh, what about maritime shipping? Well, also maritime shipping consumes approximately the same amount of diesel as uh, heavy trucks. Um, the share of uh, fossil kerosene, which here you can see in, in, um, in orange, remains constant over time. And the additional fuel that will be needed to propel the growing activity of uh, the aircraft is expected to come from biofuels and synthetic fuels. So overall, by 2070, electricity accounts for more than 35% of total final energy consumption in transport. Um, hydrogen and hydrogen carriers, which includes ammonia and, synth and synthetic jet kerosene, account for more than 30%. And fossil fuels, remain limited to just about uh, 13%. We'll now start doing a deep dive into the heart of its transport sectors. So I will pass the, the word to, to Jacob on uh, heavy tracking. Thanks, Jacobo. Uh, so we've got maritime shipping here in the slides. It seems that uh, the order is a little- I can go um, ahead there. Messed up, no but I'll, I'll, I'll switch back. I'll go from this slide. All right, so um, yeah, I'll start by talking about heavy duty trucks. Um, heavy duty trucks consume about 30% of all fuel used in road transport and the share of fuel that they consume has been growing over the past decade. So it's important to address the resulting emissions. What's shown here is the share of vehicle sales in countries that have enacted fuel efficiency CO2 standards in 2005 2016 and 2019 for light duty vehicles here on the left and for heavy duty vehicles on the right. Such standards for HDVs lag, lag those of light duty vehicles, LDVs by about a decade. And as more and more countries realize their benefits and the considerable and growing share of road fuel demanded by trucks, they are catching up. Vehicle efficiency or CO2 standards are among a portfolio of policies that will be needed to spur near-term efficiency. By themselves, they're not enough to achieve the sustainable development scenario. Also pollutant emission standards, zero and low emission zones, tolls and road usage fees differentiated by performance, ZEV sales requirements and fleet adoption support for efficient and or zero emission trucks are needed, including things like loans, grants, rebates and tax Credits. So there's a lot of inertia in road freight. Trucks are operated intensively for about a decade at most, but often half a decade, after which point they're typically used far less by second or third owners. So even in a scenario where medium and light duty trucks gain 1% market shares globally as early as 2023, as they do in this scenario, lagging electric light duty vehicles by only six years, it will still be a while before electricity registers in appreciable shares as a final energy source. In the interim, there's a real need to scale up alternative liquid fuels. Biofuels are key here because we already have pr proven commercial production, though of course, a lot of work is needed to put in place policies to ensure that the biofuels used minimize their impacts on ecosystems, resource availability, 
and to ensure that they achieve real emissions reductions on a well-to-wheel -well basis. You'll see further that synthetic fuels also penetrate the fuel mix in 2040 to 2060, but electrofuels are likely to cost even more than biofuels, and they are certainly more expensive to make than hydrogen, which is, after all, a feedstock needed to make them. So for reason, reasons of well-to-wheel -well efficiency and their cost implications, electrofuels are likely to only make sense in the midterm to fuel ICE trucks in regions with supportive policies like low carbon fuel standards or carbon taxes, and they are ultimately better suited to supply modes like aviation where fuel demand will grow and where electricity and hydrogen are less likely to serve as substitutes. As battery electric and fuel cell trucks penetrate not only new truck sales, but also fleets, they lead to a market improvement in the efficiency of trucks shown here in terms, in energy terms per ton kilometers hauled. The energy intensity of medium and heavy freight trucks drops almost in half as more and more of the truck fleet transitions from running on internal combustion engines, first to hybrid electric, then to uh, plug-in battery and fuel cell electric powertrains, or perhaps even leapfrogging conventional hybrids, which range uh, in terms of efficiency from 1.2 times to 2.5 times more efficient than conventional diesel ICE trucks. Partly as a result of these greater vehicle efficiencies, once the infrastructures have been, in, been put in place and given technology advances, advances uh, electric trucks and possibly also fuel cell trucks are likely to achieve lower ultimate costs than ICE trucks running on diesel. Add to, the fact that, add to this the fact that there are no local tailpipe emissions of pollutants that adversely in, impact health, and the clear contending destination fuels are batteries and fuel cells. But a key unresolved question is, are they likely to complement each other, each meeting the needs of separate niches in road freight? And if so, how to best characterize the price, policy, and operational conditions that favor FCVs or range extenders over BEVs? The question is a difficult one. The ultimate split of hydrogen versus electricity supplying road freight comes down to a number of critical unknowns on both technology development and deployment. It arguably also requires detailed data segmenting mileages, wages, cost of delivered electricity or hydrogen, i.e. levelized costs. The best we can do and what our team at the IEA has done is to provide informed guesses based on expected cost and performance improvement trajectories, not only in batteries and fuel cells, but also in technologies needed to generate and store low carbon electricity, like solar and wind plus batteries, and to make low carbon hydrogen, like electrolyzers. In our scenario, the global truck fleet, while growing from about 60 million vehicles today to more than 150 million trucks in 2070, first follows light duty vehicles in electrifying operations whenever possible, adopting plug-in hybrids or just conventional hybrids in longer and more intensive operations, and then adopting fuel cells, their adoption lagging electric powertrains by about a decade. It's also worth highlighting that dynamic charging, whether in road or overhead conductive or inductive, can help extend the range of operations for which plug-in battery or fuel cell electric trucks can run in competitive operations. It can also help mitigate the power demand from trucks, spreading, them, spreading it a bit over time as an alternative to ultra-fast charging. So what are the critical questions, the determinants, of whether batteries or fuel cells ultimately make more, more sense. One determinant is how fast the performance of batteries and, and of fuel cells will improve over the coming decades and how fast co costs of equipping these powertrains in vehicles that meet the needs of road freight will decline. As trucks are equipped to go longer ranges, they need larger batteries, which improve. And so the costs of owning and operating a battery electric truck increase. This is due to the low gravimetric energy density of batteries. Batteries that store a lot of energy weigh a lot. And as the truck weighs more, the less, the less efficient it becomes. This is called mass compounding. Also, the more energy a battery can store, the more, cost, the more it costs. And so the heavier the batteries, the less cargo the truck can carry. Fuel cells have the advantage that increasing the size of the tank that stores the hydrogen isn't the biggest part of the cost of the powertrain. So once you have the power provided by two fuel cell stacks adding range doesn't change the cost much. 
assuming that hydrogen can be reliably delivered at five US dollars per kilogram and reducing the cost of delivering low carbon hydrogen is another critical determinant, determinant of which uh, energy carrier will ultimately supply trucks. What we see here is that if both batteries and fuel cells meet their eventual cost targets at daily ranges of above about 400 kilometers, fuel cells that meet cost targets do have the potential to provide more economical freight service than batteries in battery electric trucks. So the future technology developments for batteries and fuel cells will matter. New battery chemistries like lithium metal batteries may lead to batteries with performance and cost characteristics that narrow or completely eliminate the niches, niches where hydrogen seems to have competitive prospects today. On the other hand, fuel cells are poised to undergo dramatic cost reductions as they are commercialized in ever large volume, larger volume. Other crucial questions concern the supply and delivery of electricity and hydrogen. First, what will be the additional costs, including generation and energy storage capacity of supplying tremendously high power charging, ranging from about 100 kilowatts to more than one megawatt. The comparison they like to use in California is that one megawatt is the peak power demand of our iconic skyscraper, the Transamerica Pyramid. Secondly, how quickly can, can hydrogen transition to low carbon production and delivery pathways? while also driving down the levelized cost of hydrogen delivered to vehicles to, to the range of around five US dollars per kilogram, which is what we have here in this figure. I'll now hand the floor back to Jacobo, who will uh, cover some of the considerations having to do with shipping. And I'll go back to those slides. Thanks, Jacob. Uh, please move to the next slide, thanks. Well, maritime shipping is a critical part of international trade, and it is the primary means by which physical goods are transported over long distances. Um, for instance, you can observe that it accounts for approximately three quarters of the total freight transport activity worldwide, measured uh, by ton kilometers. Shipping is also the um, shipping is also the least energy intense. What's happening? Yeah, next slide, next please. Shipping is also the least energy intensive way to carry the goods. Um, like even if it has a share of total free transport approximately 75%, it is only responsible for one fifth of the energy used in freight transport and only 88% of total transport energy used. In 2019, maritime shipping consumed 220 megatons of equivalent oil so basically, everything, everything came from fossil fuel. Um, 180 from uh, heavy fuel oil, 45 from distillate oil products such as uh, maritime diesel oil and uh, maritime gas oil, while liquefied natural gas accounted for less than one MTOE. Um, regarding CO2 emissions, in 2019, uh, shipping accounted for 710 megatons which equals to almost 10% of total transport emissions and 2% of total energy-related emissions. Steering shipping from a trajectory in line with the stated policy scenario to a trajectory in line with the sustainable development scenario requires several measures. Efficiency measures, which here are described in, uh, are indicated in yellow and purple, um, um, are going to, are expected to make the biggest contribution to reduce emissions below the levels in the stated policy scenario. Uh, efficiency measures are in, are include hybridization, for instance, uh, hybridization done, done by, with electric batteries, and also uh, includes sails and other wind propulsion technologies, then a slow steaming, which consists in reducing the speed of the vessel, and also improving hull coatings to reduce the friction of the vessel and waste heat recovery. The contribution of, electri of uh, electricity is quite limited, as you can see in the light, um, light uh, blue. And this is due to the fact that uh, er the, the energy density of batteries uh, is limited and makes uh, a pure electric ship suitable only on routes of less than 100 kilometers. Over time, the largest share of emission reductions is achieved through fuel switching 
and the adoption of new maritime propulsion technologies that can use biofuels, ammonia, and to a lower extent also hydrogen. However, several of the technologies that are needed to transition maritime shipping towards carbon neutrality are not yet commercially available. Indeed, almost 80% of the cumulative emission savings in the sustainable development scenario are expected to be delivered by technologies that today are only at prototype or demonstration level. This highlights the importance of innovation in the maritime sector to achieve the climate targets. It also calls for the need to scale up the investment in research, development, and demonstration in the next few years. Uh, let's, uh, thanks. let's now look more deeply into what happens to the shipping sector in the sustainable development scenario. Well, in the short term, let's say before 2030, to meet the Inter uh, International Maritime Organization Sulfur Cup, shipping operations switch from uh, heavy, heavy, uh, heavy fuel heavy sulfur fuel oil to very low sulfur fuel oil, marine, marine diesel, and uh, liquefied natural gas. And in the 2020s, we also see some initial blending of biofuels with bank, uh, within bunker fuels. Then in the medium term, uh, blending with biofuels increases to an extent that, uh, to the point that in 2060, biofuels account for approximately one fifth of the total energy use in shipping. And these uh, biofuels are mostly biofuel oils and uh, fatty acid uh, methyl esters. Ammonia and hydrogen are the two destination fuels for the maritime shipping sector. The first, ammonia, for long distance ocean going vessels. And the second, hydrogen, for vessels with medium distance mission profiles. Therefore, uh, in the longer term, these two fuels come increasingly, uh, increasingly to the fore and approximately 60% of the new vessels that are sold after 2060 use these fuels. Ammonia used in shipping reaches approximately 130 megatons of equivalent oil in 2070, which is twice as much as what was used worldwide for fertilizer production in 2019. While um, the role of hydrogen as a fuel for large vessels is limited, due to the high cost of uh, hydrogen storage and its low energy density. But as, I, but as I said, it still plays a role for medium distance shipping. In 2070, oil and gas are responsible for approximately one sixth of total shipping for consum consumption. Um, well, regarding CO2 emissions, um, CO2 emissions from shipping peak in the early 2020s, around 2025 and uh, they peak at the same level as in 2019. And afterwards, they rapidly decline uh, until achieving 320 megatons of CO2 in 2050, which is brought in line with the International Maritime Organization greenhouse gas emission targets. And afterwards, emissions decline until 120 megatons in 2070. So as you can see, and as I have discussed, maritime shipping does not reach net zero emissions until after 2070. And this is to do the fact that it has a high cost of abating emissions in these subsectors. So these remaining emissions are offset by negative emissions in other energy sectors that are cheaper to decarbonize. So that overall by 2070, we need, we, we reach net zero emissions. Next slide, thanks. Um, at present today, it looks like that uh, any low or zero carbon fuel suitable for shipping is, that is going to be more expensive than fossil fuels that we're currently using it. So um, the adoption of low and zero carbon fuels is likely to require some form of price mechanism that is, is needed to create the greater market equality. Today, no form of carbon tax exists for international shipping, but for national shipping, there are some carbon taxes that are applied in certain countries. Um, we explore the case of uh, a carbon price of 100 US dollars per ton of CO2. And if such carbon price were to be implemented, by 2030, ammonia internal combustion engines vessels would be almost on a, pair, uh, on a cost pair with fossil vessels on a total cost of ownership basis. I give you the floor again, Jacob, on, uh, on aviation, which is the last 
of all our hard to date sectors that we have explored in ETP 25. Right, on to aviation, where decarbonizing operations is perhaps the most difficult of all, and where the technology prospects are no less uncertain than in trucks. So what are the key factors that make aviation CO2 emissions so difficult to abate? Three elements stand out. First, activity growth in aviation has been rapid and is likely to continue to be so in the future, before the current crisis, of course. Second, the industry structure of aviation is unique. The big aircraft and jet engine manufacturers are national champions backed by public support for aerospace and military research, both the incumbent ones and their potential successors. Airlines operate with tight margins and many weren't profitable even before 2020 hit. Finally, the physics doesn't help. Aviation needs energy dense fuels, both in terms of gravimetric density, you end up burning fuel to carry fuel in aviation and in terms of volumetric density, which is one of the reasons that Airbus's hydrogen airframes would have to be white sheets drafted on a wholly new design. Com commercial passenger aviation, which makes up 86% of fuel use in aviation overall, has clearly been among the most visibly hard hit sectors of the economy. Worldwide passenger volumes hit bottom when they dropped by nearly 95% in April, 2020, and the number of scheduled flights in the first week of May was nearly 70% lower than in the same week of 2019, but with as few as 37% of seats occupied. More than a third of the world's aircraft remained grounded in late July, 2020. Industry estimates have passenger volumes as a whole declining by 50% in 2020, and international passenger volumes are set to decline by at least 60%. And with the second big wave upon us in Europe, it may be hard to imagine a time when demand for flights will not only rebound, but grow at anywhere near recent historic rates. It's worth, however, keeping an open mind on the extent to which people and companies will reevaluate their flying habits um, at some virtual aviation conferences. Inevitably, someone will be so bold as to assert that 2020 is the end of an era when people will fly around the world to share PowerPoints with each other in a hotel for a day or two. But even if demand doesn't emerge from the post-pandemic world structurally diminished with uh, fewer international and business flights, there are still a lot of reasons to believe that um, the conservative project projection of activity growth shown here, which is far lower than nearly all pre-pandemic projections, but nevertheless still sees activity growing 2.2 uh, to 2.5 fold by mid-century and more than tripling by 2070, is still a very plausible trajectory. The long-term technology options for aircraft engine, uh, engines and alternative powertrains and fuels vary by distance. Many of the ones that have the greatest potential have not been fully deployed, even at a full prototype at scale and rely on technologies and designs that range from concepts in need of validation to early prototypes to components that have been demonstrated. Technologies that haven't yet reached the level of large prototype are listed on this slide under the disruptive technologies on the bottom right. Given the right incentive structures, however, at least some of these technologies may begin entering into operation as early as the mid to late 2030s or more likely in the 2040s, and our modeling does explore their potential though we don't yet have hydrogen aircraft in our uh, modeling suite of tools, whether direct combustion or fuel cells. Looking at this figure of the cumulative density of flights in green and fuel in red, you can see that most flights are short haul. About 80% of flights are less than 2,000 kilometers and constitute about 37% of fuel burn. The most fuel burned is on medium and long haul flights, over half on flights of more than 3,000 kilometers. Let's focus for now on the technology concepts that rely on electricity. With battery electric densities having tripled over the past decade while costs have dropped by about 85%, there's reason to be bullish about the prospects for continuing improvement. In the sustainable development scenario though, by 2050 solid state lithium batteries with a pack level density of about 400 watt hours per kilogram would be energy dense enough to just displace more than one fifth of flights, but only about 5% of fuel burn. This, this means that all electric air, aircraft just entering the fleet in 2050 would only be able to cover a small share of the services that aviation currently provides. 
In a more disruptive case, if we assume that lithium sulfur batteries develop at a state to a state where they can be used in commercial aviation, and that pack energy level densities of about 800 watt hours per kilogram could be achieved by 2050, aircraft introduced by around mid-century could begin to penetrate the fleet. And after an additional 15, 30 year lag for the entire turnover of the fleet, uh, they could be expected to displace almost 20% of fuel burn and over half of all flights. In scenarios of future energy systems that incorporate these impressive but not implausible improvements in battery technology, if you were to assume that by 2070, already about 40% of flights in the range of around just over a thousand kilometers were to be taken on electric aircraft, you would indeed need gigafactories to make their batteries and a huge amount of electricity, about 650 terawatt hours or a bit more than is currently consumed by Germany plus Greece combined to power them. But if you put this in, into perspective of the uh, entire energy system, which itself is, is rap rapidly electrifying under any plausible decarbonization scenario, this would account for only about 6% of all transport electricity demand in 2070 and even far lower percentage in terms of total energy demand across all sectors. Um, and indeed the uh, electricity generation capacity is dwarfed by the needs in the sustainable development scenario for um, low carbon uh, electrolytic uh, uh, hydrogen production, for instance. Moving on to other technology options, uh, the range of hybrid electric aircraft is also somewhat limited and may extend into the 3000 plus kilometer range. Um, hydrogen aircraft, the concepts of which uh, Airbus has recently introduced are again, less range limited and may offer a potential fuel switching opportunity. But ultimately, uh, the contribution of sustainable aviation fuels is critical towards achieving uh, the sustainable development scenario. What this means is that it, it will be exceedingly difficult to achieve ICAO's aspirational goal of carbon neutral growth for civil aviation from 2021 onwards. Although, of course, the industry has always openly conceded that offsets outside of the aviation sector are envisioned to be a major, if not the, the main means of achieving the carbon offsetting and reduction scheme for international aviation, for SIA. Even with the operational and technical opportunities uh, we assessed, more on those in a bit, the major opportunity in a sector where the physics dictates that you need energy and power dense fuels will be for sustainable aviation fuels in all segments of, of more than about a thousand kilometers. Biojet fuels blended into conventional petroleum-based jet fuel currently account for only about 0.01% of total aviation fuel consumption, but that share needs to rise to about a quarter by 2040 and uh, then drops down again to about, or continues to rise to about 35% by 2070. By that time, about 4.4 million barrels of oil per day of biofuels are used in aviation, more than double the total biofuels produced in 2019 for road transport purposes. Synthetic jet kerosene concentrated from concentrated industrial sources from uh, biomass feedstocks or even uh, via di direct air capture plus, uh, bio, uh, plus using electrolytic hydrogen um, account for um, another growing share from about 2030 of the sustainable aviation fuels. And here there's a sustan substantial potential for cost reductions um, coming from the reducing costs of uh, um, solar and wind and uh, electrolysis. So the emissions reductions that can be achieved in the sustainable develop development scenario over, over and above the stated policy scenario are mostly not coming from avoided demand nor even from efficient aircraft and engines. The reduction in demand that comes from increased ticket prices is minuscule. Um, about 4% of cumulative emission reductions uh, between the two scenarios for two reasons. First, the elasticity of demand with respect to fuel price reflected in the ticket price is very small in the case of aviation. And second, the higher fuel costs spur further investments and innovation in technical and operational efficiency, reducing their impact on a per ticket or per flight basis. 
Indeed, the technology improves at rates slightly lower than historical rates uh, going out to 2030 at about 2.2% per year, though this is higher than the aspirational goals set by both ICAO and IATA. Operational and technical efficiency uh, together contribute about 20% of the cumulative emission reductions in the SDS. But as is made clear by the decomposition shown here, alternative fuels are the major wedge between the, the trajectories of the stated policy scenario and the sustainable development scenario. They make up the remaining three quarters of total additional emission reductions between the scenarios. This figure shows a production cost range for fossil jet kerosene, hydroprocessed esters and fatty acids, HIFA, jet, biomass to liquids, BTL or Fischer tropes with and without CCS and synfuels, uh, power to liquids using CO2 sourced from direct air capture and hydrogen again from water electrolysis. It also gives the impacts uh, of a carbon price of 150 US dollars per ton CO2 for the sake of comparison. First, it's worth emphasizing that these pathways are at different stages. HAFA is technically mature, synfuels with direct air capture are still quite a ways off. The price gap between SAFs and fossil jet fuel is large and can still persist even in the presence of carbon price, though the inclusion of carbon capture and storage technology can improve the overall economics. Continuing uncertainty around biomass, CO2, and hydrogen feedstock costs for sustainable aviation fuels exacerbate the challenge on our side just for assessing the competitive prospects of these options, but also for investors and companies in terms of plotting a course to realize production of these sustainable aviation fuels. So thanks for uh, staying with us for the presentation. And uh, what we'd like to do now is to open things up for questions. Many thanks Jacob and, and Jacopo for the detailed presentation. We, we are receiving plenty of questions, so we are structuring them a bit so that we can answer them by, by topic. Um, let me perhaps clarify some of the more horizontal aspects or kind of cross-cutting questions that have been raised before that. Um, just perhaps a bit of context on the scenarios that are underpinning the Energy Technology Perspectives 2020 and this uh, analysis as well on, on different transportation um, modes. Uh, there's been some questions around which scenarios are we using, the boundaries and uh, some of the acronyms involved. So, so just to clarify, there's two core scenarios uh, that have been uh, analyzed and developed in ETP 2020 and both uh, shown in this presentation. The first one is called uh, STEPS, Stated Policy Scenario, which is the acronym is STEPS, which there's been some questions about that. So it's not a region, but actually it's a, it's a scenario. And uh, this is the scenario that we've used for more uh, let's say uh, baseline purposes. So it's reflecting the expected trajectories if the um, policies that are in place or are announced uh, would basically uh, continue and, uh, and that would be the result uh, across the energy, the energy system. The alternative scenario is the sustainable development scenario that we've used to basically explore what would be the implications of uh, reaching this uh, transition towards net zero emissions that is reached at the global level in this scenario by 2070. And we do that by 2070, as uh, is shown in this, uh, in this slide, by having some uh, still residual emissions in those areas that are more difficult to abate, uh, but that are compensated with uh, negative emissions uh, from different uh, technologies and applications that allow for this, either through capture of emissions directly from or CO2 directly from the atmosphere or from uh, applications that uh, use uh, bioenergy, different forms of bioenergy as well. The, I mean, beyond this, uh, these two scenarios, uh, as I've mentioned, stated policy scenario and also the sustainable development scenario, which indeed is compatible with the Paris Agreement. Uh, we've also explored the feasibility in this edition uh, of uh, reaching uh, net zero emissions by 2050 at the global level, uh, a bit in response with all this uh, announcements that we've seen, as Jacopo mentioned, uh, in the context setting. And despite this is not a globally adopted goal, we wanted to explore the feasibility of, of reaching that uh, again at the global level through the lenses of uh, technology and in particular technology innovation. So through shortening the periods from 
lab to market, uh, but also accelerating the deployment uh, rate of some of these early adoption technologies. And we did that in a faster innovation case, uh, which uh, is part of the uh, ETP 2020, also available uh, in the publication and discussed in, in quite a lot of detail, but it has not been presented in this uh, current deck uh, that uh, my colleagues have gone through. Um, so we can um, provide more details on that in the Q&A if, if needed, but just to clarify that context. Um, with that, uh, I propose that uh, we uh, group the questions by, by theme a little bit uh, as following the structure that we've used in the presentation. Um, so we could perhaps start by addressing some of the questions related to, to tracks. And so what I'll do is perhaps just read the, the questions we've been getting and then uh, Jacob uh, can go through this uh, in kind of a a joint uh, response, if that makes sense. We can get back with more details if needed. There was uh, some clarifications needed, uh, people asking about uh, whether hydrogen ICs uh, were considered, uh, but then more, more broadly, uh, there were questions around um, whether we should uh, show the, um, instead of the shared perfume, and that can be a bit misleading as the efficiency perfume is very different. Why not a slide on uh, kilometers driven perfume and a, another one on energy efficiency perfume. So perhaps uh, just some clarifications here about why we choose uh, displaying some of the metrics and what can be found as well in the full uh, chapter in the publication. Um, there was also some comments around uh, the TCO analysis. So a colleague mentioning that he would argue that sensitivity analysis on track TCO for battery electric trucks and a few cell electric trucks which should have been done on the electricity uh, versus hydrogen cost and not on the battery versus fuel cell cost. There's more uncertainty on the former than the later and uh, was asking about, you know, what sensitivity analysis we've also performed on the fuel price um, to basically reach those, uh, those conclusions. So again, some more uh, clarification on the methods on the analysis that were used. And also related to the TCO, so if we could comment more on the TCO for trucks decreasing and then start increasing over time. So some questions around that analysis as well. So perhaps with this block, I pass the floor to Jacob uh, to respond to this and then we can carry on. Great, thanks, Araceli. I'll take on this final question first. Um, it's important to note that the x-axis here is vehicle range. So um, uh, what, you're, what you're seeing is uh, that the, the total cost of ownership per, uh, per kilometer is dropping in the case uh, of, of both battery electric and fuel cell electrics uh, initially to about uh, 400 kilometers. Um, and then it's increasing quite a bit as the costs of uh, higher capacity uh, battery that would be needed for longer ranges uh, continues to increase. So th there's, there's no time element in this figure other than the, ex the, the extent to which you're going to reduce uh, the costs of the battery and the fuel cell as you, you know, as functions of economies of scale or technology learning. Um, so as you move to better chemistries in the case of batteries, and especially as you, re as you uh, exploit economies of scale in the, in the case of fuel, cell, uh, fuel cells for trucks. Um, another question that you asked, I think, is um, whether we've considered hydrogen ICEs, and indeed we haven't. Um, mostly this is because there is a lot of potential uh, that we've seen coming out of reports uh, from the US DOE, but also from our colleagues, for instance, at Toyota, in uh, terms of reducing the costs of uh, fuel cell production um, and equipping them into trucks as you, as you uh, build out uh, production capacity um, and simply as a function of economies of scale. Uh, that plus the fact that you have a much uh, higher efficiency and uh, well, essentially because of the efficiency opportunities of fuel cell have, have convinced us that for our long-term modeling purposes, uh, we won't uh, explicitly consider hydrogen ICEs. You could argue that in the near term, uh, hydrogen ICEs might be a promising opportunity uh, to use hydrogen also in the road sector um, to help build out certainty of demand um, as refueling stations are built. Um, but kind of for the purposes of our long-term modeling, we didn't explicitly consider a transition that first goes to um, hydrogen in internal combustion engines and then to fuel cells. 
There's another question about, or another uh, statement that I think is, is right on, on um, about the fact that the sensitivity uh, of uh, these competing powertrains in terms of the total cost of operations and ownership is, is probably even more sensitive to the levelized cost of uh, electricity or hydrogen, um, including you know, all the costs that have to do with electricity production, transmission, generation, and then the costs of building out very, very fast um, uh, charging infrastructure um, and then sensitive to the utilization of that infrastructure on the side of electricity. And similarly, on the side of hydrogen, the costs of uh, producing low carbon hydrogen, uh, either blue or green hydrogen. So that is either through SMR with CCS or coal gasification in the case of China with CCS um, or electrolytic hydrogen, delivering it to the station if need be, uh, if it's not on site electrolytic uh, hydrogen, um, storing it, um, pressurizing it, and then, and then delivering it to the vehicle. And, and, and lots of the equipment that would be needed to deliver on the speeds necessary for the volumes of hydrogen storage in trucks is not even available yet. Um, indeed, you know, we did pre perform a sensitivity analysis on the delivered price of electricity, uh, the delivered cost of electricity versus hydrogen. And there's another figure in the report uh, that uh, explores that sensitivity. Um, I'll look for it now in the slides and maybe we'll come back to that question um, in a bit. But um, I hope that, uh, you know, alternatively, the, all of the reports that Araceli actually mentioned at the beginning um, are free, freely available to everyone um, once you create a use, user profile and log in. So I would welcome you to look in chapter five of the ETP 2020, Energy Technology Perspectives 2020 report. Um, one other kind of housekeeping item, uh, someone asked whether the um, slides would be uh, shared. And for those of you who have uh, joined us today, I, we would be happy to share the slide deck that we presented on for anyone who's interested. Excellent, thanks, uh, Jacob. Uh, there's a couple more kind of clarification questions coming in the chat on, on track, so I'm a bit tempted to perhaps clarify this with you, if that's fine, and then we, we'll uh, move to shipping, I think. I mean, just whether uh, ammonia uh, ICs, internal combustion engines, uh, have been considering heavy duty trucks, for instance. Um, and also, I mean, if we are considering improvement in battery energy densities. Um, so I think these two uh, seem to me good to clarify at this point. And there's a couple more uh, related to hydrogen and uh, some considerations on the, uh, the scale up of uh, hydrogen supply that we could deal with um, at, the, at the end, if that makes sense. Thanks, yeah. Uh, so we haven't considered ammonia for ICEs for heavy duty trucks. And, and here it's kind of, uh, you know, the, the most promising and real commercially real op options that we see, um, you know, companies and uh, investors uh, focusing their attention on, let alone uh, policymakers, are uh, kind of the destination fuels for trucks uh, seem to be hydrogen and electricity in the f and, and using fuel cells and, and, and battery electric powertrains respectively. Um, you know, there are toxics toxicity uh, and, and, and health and safety issues around ammonia as well. Um, and then, you know, ammonia. No, in, sorry? Ammonia in, in ICEs is, is not something that uh, falls into this kind of longer term uh, energy modeling uh, exercise uh, that we uh, have, have, have done on the ETP side. Um, the other question about whether we consider uh, energy density uh, for batteries improving, indeed we have um, kind of a, uh, a learning rate embedded in our, in our modeling. And so we do get to energy densities out by 2050 that would require solid state uh, batteries. And so you do see uh, continuing improvement in uh, the energy densities uh, of batteries used in both in road transport and to a very small extent also in uh, shipping and, and ultimately much later in the scenario in aviation. Um, we also, as Jacopo mentioned, take on a case where um, 
we consider the question of what uh, innovation efforts would be needed to reach net zero in 2050. And so that kind of holds the demand drivers constant, the behavioral drivers constant, but looks at what kind of um, technology performance could help achieve net zero in 2050. And there we, we, we consider a kind of a much, uh, much, much faster accelerated um, uh, innovation for batteries such that uh, you get to energy densities that are, that are you know, on par with lithium sulfur, lithium air chemistries already by the second half of the century. Okay, great. Thanks, um, Jacob. Uh, Jacob, sorry. Um, then uh, next we could uh, we group some questions so we could deal with them on, on shipping, which was the next uh, kind of block in the presentation. So Jacopo can clarify some of these aspects with colleagues. Uh, there were some questions around um, as well whether certain technologies were included or not. Uh, for instance, uh, people asking about whether uh, wind power for ships was included, um, as well as uh, nuclear propulsion for shipping. So perhaps a clarification on there. And then there is a, a block of uh, or group of questions uh, related to, to ammonia that we could uh, clarify as well uh, together. Um, so a comment on uh, from the audience was on uh, the IA expects a major role for ammonia in maritime shipping. Would that be uh, for combustion in engines or using fuel cells? And if uh, we took uh, constraints into account, such as ammonia being pretty aggressive and poisonous, etc. Um, also related to ammonia, some questions around how it's produced, uh, which kind of routes and technologies are considered there, which starting to, to touch a little bit on the supply side, but um, I think it makes sense to, to deal with this here. Um, and then uh, again, related to this, uh, there's a comment around uh, that in our scenario, hydrogen and electricity and ammonia, as well as synthetic fuels seem to be considering, uh, considered as zero emissions. So they, this would be uh, almost true when electricity production would be fully uh, from renewables, surely not along next decade, and possibly even beyond an international level. How have you considered this issue in your estimation? So again, this is touching a little bit on the supply side, but perhaps a few uh, caveats here, notions perhaps uh, starting with uh, Jacopo and if uh, Fabino or other colleagues would like to complement as well here would be would be great. Thanks, thanks for the question. Thanks Sally for grouping them. Well, regarding if we have uh, taken into account wind power for ships, yes, we have. And uh, we have a slide showing that uh, indeed the technology, technology performance improvements make up uh, the larger um, emission savings in the sustainable development scenario compared to the stated policy scenario, especially in the short term. And these uh, technology performance improvements include indeed wind power. So for wind power, we take it into, we assessed what can be the role of uh, uh, sails, kites, and also flattener rotors, which today are at low, lower technology readiness level, that, but there are already some cases on a couple of, maybe more, less, less than 10 ships with, on which these are installed. And the reasons why we have decided to take into account uh, wind propulsion because, is that um, is because whatever fuel will be used in the future in shipping uh, to make shipping low carbon, the carbon neutral, this must be zero carbon fuels, right? And all zero carbon fuels for shipping, we saw that are expected to be more expensive, much more expensive than current fossil fuels. So whatever every ship owner would see energy efficiency measures as a strategy to reduce the cost of these fuels, especially in shipping, where fuels make up for the lion's share of the total cost of ownership, because these ships consume a lot of fuel and they're operating every day and every night, right? So from a total cost of ownership point of view, fuels make up for a very high cost. So whatever um, operational measure or technology measure can reduce the cost is welcome. And um, we have an inside figure also for, for, for wind. We have not taken into account nuclear ships because uh, we did the review of uh, major projects around the world entailing different low carbon te uh, op technology options for shipping. And we didn't see nuclear as nuclear power trains as playing uh, a big role. Well, regarding the many questions of ammonia, um, 
Yes, ammonia would be used in internal combustion engines, at least initially. And I would say for the larger part of this, um, of this, uh, yeah, for the first part of the center, almost, uh, almost surely. Um, we took into account constraints. We are well aware that ammonia is toxic, but uh, um, it's, to it's toxic, it's true, but it can be detected when, uh, by the human nose, when the concentration is much lower than what bec becomes hazardous. At the same time, we have discussed this topic with a lot of experts on this. Uh, we discussed our analysis, our findings with experts of the Technology Collaboration Network, the different TCPs, and we could rely on uh, world leaders and experts on, on, on these topics. So um, we have to say that today it's true that ammonia is toxic, but it's also the most traded chemical commodity today. So there is already a lot of know-how about uh, this is transported in ships. However, it's true that uh, the ships are carrying ammonia, but they're not fueled with ammonia. So we need in the future, in the next 10 years, to develop the so-called ICF, which are the standards that enable to use ammonia and hydrogen as a fuel. Um, well, ammonia is toxic, but it's also true that hydrogen is explosive and hydrogen would be stored as liquid. And once this, uh, the, is, in case there is, a, so it causes brittle embrittlement of materials. And in case there is a leakage, there is, um, the, the, the energy density is so fast that uh, it could create uh, um, uh, is issues to the structure of the ships, basically. Um, I think I have answered to the questions on ammonia uh, regarding the production, where production of ammonia, we can establish a parallelism with production of hydrogen, right? Ultimately, it would reproduce with hydrogen plus the Haber-Bosch process. And uh, we uh, see in the sustainable development scenario, hydrogen mostly be produced from uh, natural gas through steam methane reforming, at least uh, at the, um, in, in, the, uh, in the short term. Then this would be coupled with uh, carbon capture and storage. So we would talk about uh, uh, blue hydrogen. Uh, and finally, uh, the, trans the, the, the destination production pathway for hydrogen and therefore also for ammonia would be um, electrolysis of water from dedicated renewables. I don't know if the um, colleagues from supply want to add something about that. Just wanted to add also some insights about the comments of uh, the scope of uh, fuel cells, electric vehicles, battery electric vehicles. Well, indeed in the transport sector, we account emissions only coming from direct combustion of the end use technologies. But this doesn't mean that we are disregarding these uh, the, the emissions that are related to electric vehicles and fuel cell electric vehicles. It's just that these emissions are released in the production pathways, right? Uh, in, in the production paths. And so they are located in the, to the supply sector in the ETP 2020 framework. Uh, in general, we also uh, evaluate and compare the different powertrains across modes, also with a life cycle uh, assessment perspective. This was not done in the, in the ETP 2020 publication, but we have dedicated publication where we do this uh, every year, such as Bolivia out. You know, Jacob or Praveen, if you want to expand on the supply, on the supply side. Thanks. Yeah, I, sorry, go ahead, Araceli. That's fine. Um, just to say that um, we could put on some of these slides, and I'll share my screen here, that uh, uh, detail the production pathways and the shift um, from current production, uh, hydrogen production uh, technologies to um, first to SMR with CCS, and then the, the growing share of electrolytic hydrogen, and perhaps Praveen, if you want to speak to those um, slides, uh, you're welcome to do so. You can put those on. Hi, everybody. So I'm Praveen. I'm on the ETP supply team. And so I know there's the question regarding how the emissions are allocated to transport versus supply. And like Jacopo said, when it comes to producing hydrogen from either natural gas with CCS or on the elect electrolytic pathway, those emissions are included in the supply side analysis and kind of in reporting. So that's why they're considered zero emission um, when looking at transport. And then if I 
if I heard correctly, there was yes, yeah, the discussion of how hydrogen production is is will grow going forward. So as you can see from this chart, today most of the hydrogen is produced from fossil fuel without CCUS, without carbon capture and storage. But as we see starting in 2040, the hydrogen production becomes majority low carbon, focusing almost exclusively a split between fossil uh, natural gas with CCUS and also hydrogen coming from electrolysis. And this electrolysis can be powered both by grid and by dedicated renewable energy systems. So we do consider both of these electrical sources when looking at hyd uh, electrolytic hydrogen. And I'm not sure if, if Jose is on, if he wants to add more about the hy hydrogen production in the SDS scenario. Um, hi here, Jose Bermudet, as well from the supply team, and nothing to add on, on what Pravin has just said. So she said uh, we have considered in the SDS that uh, for hydrogen to become an enabler of this clean energy transition, and this is how we have accounted on the on the heart of the base sectors, it has to be produ produced mainly through low carbon routes, both um, uh, electrolytic power by renewables or uh, uh, fossil fuels with CCUS. Great, thanks. Thanks a lot for all the inputs uh, uh, for our colleagues. Um, let's uh, pass now on to aviation um, so we can deal with some of these questions here. And um, in any case, we are going to get back to some of the supply aspects later on. So let's leave some details there. Um, just on aviation, uh, I thought it would be good uh, looking at the questions so we could clarify some of the aspects as well at the beginning on the analysis and what is included, etc. And then uh, I let uh, Jacob respond to these uh, initial questions and then uh, there would be another kind of block more on the, uh, with some kind of connection as well with the supply side. So how some of the sustainable aviation fuels are, are delivered and, and produced. Um, so first question uh, was on why is the high energy density battery a possible scenario for aircraft, uh, but not for battery electric trucks? Um, my understanding was that hydrogen uh, and e-fuels would become cost-effective in aircraft significantly sooner than for on-road applications. So, um, and question clarification on, on these aspects there. And then perhaps um, another question, uh, so more on the uh, demand for, uh, for mobility and flights uh, in this sense, uh, on top of the new uh, working and vacation habits inherited from the pandemic, don't you believe that an avoidable increase in aviation costs will slow the growth of activity. So that's a question more on the, on the demand side. And, and the last one for this block, uh, in addition to direct CO2 emissions, there are additional effects due to pollutant emissions at high altitude that create climate impacts, including contrails formation. Are those effects taken into account? So perhaps these this three uh, kind of clarifications around some of the considerations behind the analysis, and then we'll proceed uh, further. Thanks, Araceli. Uh, yeah, so the first question, um, I uh, want to kind of clarify that uh, high energy density batteries, so a continued progress uh, in the energy density of batteries is consistent across uh, vehicles in the sustainable development scenario. So we consider the same improvements in uh, battery energy densities for trucks, for cars, and for aircraft in the SDS. When I referred to the um, other scenario or the kind of case, it wasn't a full-blown scenario where we considered uh, what might be needed uh, in terms of innovation to reach net zero by 2050. And we um, you know, considered the case of faster innovation bringing about uh, energy densities equivalent to lithium or sulfur or lithium air batteries. We applied that case also, not just for um, aircraft, but also for ships and trucks. And um, you see more cost competitiveness in the battery electric uh, vehicles across the board. So whether for road transport, shipping, or aviation. On the second aspect of this question, the question about um, you know, the understanding that hydrogen would become cost effective in aircraft significantly sooner than for road applications. Not so, uh, really. I mean, even right now, um, uh, uh, electrofuels, synthetic fuels uh, would probably uh, be easier to introduce in the road sector just because of uh, fuel taxation leading to higher margins 
and the kind of fuels needed in the road sector in, in many cases uh, being cheaper to produce. Um, so something that's implied in these scenarios is some kind of policy action that would either send price signals or through some kind of um, uh, supportive mechanisms like co low carbon fuel standards would um, mandate a reduction in the carbon intensity of the fuels uh, supplying the aviation sector so that e-fuels or hydrogen would become co com cost competitive in aviation um, rather than in road applications. Um, so, you know, indeed within a scenario, we uh, try to use consistent uh, technology assumptions, but the policy assumptions that drive the scenario results uh, might vary from sector to sector. The next question about um, whether new working and vacation habits inherited from the pandemic might lead to an unavoidable increase in the aviation costs. That's a really good question. I mean, the, 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 the greatest margins that um, uh, uh, airlines make are on these business flights, um, not on business class flights. And so, you know, th there will be a reduction in activity uh, uh, and in demand growth just simply because of the new equilibrium, equilibrium that will be met. Um, you know, this is a uncharted territory and it's, it's very difficult to calibrate exactly where uh, demand might go, especially once you reach the second half of the century. Um, we use the modeling tools we have and the kind of elasticities that we find in the literature. We had to, of course, adopt ways to account for the COVID crisis and how it will structurally impact demand, including this question of, you know, the lower margins that airlines can, can make uh, if they're seeing a smaller share of business travel. Um, and, and the, the uh, activity projections that you see here reflect those considerations as best as possible. I welcome you to compare these activity projections with the activity projections that were being made by, uh, you know, groups like ICAO or Airbus or Boeing or any other organizations prior to the pandemic. You'll find that they're much more conservative. Nevertheless, you know, perhaps they are too bullish. In that case, um, you know, then we've kind of overestimated the um, work that needs to happen on the technology side and on the cost side uh, for the aviation to contribute to the sustainable development scenario. And I think that that behooves us to come up with our best estimate, but not guess too low in terms of activity growth. growth. Um, the last question is a really interesting and important question. Um, you know, here we're accounting for the direct CO2 emissions from uh, fossil fuel combustion, as is the IEA's accounting framework, but we are not reporting on the additional effects uh, due to things like uh, contrail formation um, or, you know, other uh, high altitude emissions uh, that have impacts on climate forcing, on, on global warming. Um, you know, clearly those are other things that are going to be, uh, need to be addressed. And, you know, as, as has already been mentioned in some of the questions and responses before, the emissions that come from producing the fuels are another thing that are going to need to be addressed. It's a question that's uh, particular to aviation and, and we haven't uh, kind of delved into it in this publication. We have made mention of it. But um, in a commentary that we're working on currently, um, we, we want to kind of highlight the fact that just uh, addressing the CO2 emissions from uh, fossil fuel combustion or indeed from sustainable aviation fuels is not enough. You do need to also take into account uh, these other climate forcing impacts. Um, and you know there are ways to reroute flights even to try to reduce the impacts that don't come from direct CO2 emissions. Great, thanks, uh, thanks, Jacob. Um, so we can now move with uh, some questions uh, still related to, to aviation, but that touch a bit more on the supply of aviation fuels. Uh, the first one is on how do we expect uh, to produce uh, fossil jet kerosene needed in 2070 for the aviation sector if most of the other industries moved away from carbon-based energy? Um, so I can perhaps uh, provide a response here and then move to, to additional questions on this area. Um, indeed, this is uh, uh, one of the challenges around how to reconfigure in a way the current uh, kind of different types of refineries, how to deal with the different crude uh, oil types 
and deliver the kind of diversified uh, oil slates that is uh, at the moment used in the in the energy system and with some areas indeed uh, in such transition moving away from uh, fossil fuel uh, fossil uh, based fuels uh, how uh, we can keep uh, the production at certain levels for some of these uh, products that would still be demanded and another example uh, beyond uh, jet kerosene uh, which again poses uh, quite some uh, important challenges as Jacob was discussing in terms of finding alternatives to it um, is as well uh, those type of oil products that are used as, as feedstock for different uh, chemical commodities, uh, particularly like olefins. Um, and those, uh, this is a segment of oil demand that in our scenarios, both uh, not just in steps uh, in this kind of baseline uh, prediction, but also in our sustainable development scenario, we expect uh, to be the, the, grow, the, the, the oil demand segment that will grow the largest um, in that projection uh, moving forward. Um, so we are indeed in, in need of, uh, in a way, finding uh, and resolving this challenge of reconfiguring how to produce uh, a different, uh, let's say, oil product slate that would be uh, lighter and that would satisfy this demand of, uh, for uh, areas in which uh, alternatives are, are difficult uh, indeed, or that would then be really uh, finding a full, let's say, decarbonization or fossil uh, or a shift away from fossil fuels. Uh, in that transition. There's, there's already um, uh, research and even uh, demonstration um, and some uh, operational trials already, uh, for instance, in the Middle East, trying to find uh, some of these alternative configuration uh, in particular to, to deliver more effectively the, the specific uh, um, oil demand uh, or oil uh, uh, products that would be demanded by the chemical industry. Uh, where, with a process uh, and a configuration that would go directly from crude oil to uh, uh, chemical feedstocks, basically, so olefins, um, such as ethylene and propylene, for instance. So there's these catalytic processes that uh, uh, also in some cases uh, would allow for this direct step. And uh, there's uh, trials, as I've mentioned, uh, looking at uh, not just demonstrating this, uh, these processes, there's two or three licenses on the way, but also how to uh, scale that process uh, up. So um, some possibilities on that on that area, but indeed uh, further work will be needed to make sure that um, we are not in a way creating another problem by you know uh, shifting partially some of these uh, some of these uh, services uh, moving away from fossil fuels. Um, there's also some additional questions uh, on the I mean, related to aviation fuels. Uh, let's perhaps tackle them together. Um, there's a question around whether uh, if CCS is really the best use of carbon available from biomass and why is it better to store this underground rather than as a replacement of fossil carbon in centralized fuel production plants. So this was uh, raised in the context of uh, the aviation, uh, let's say, presentation, but of course has a bit wider implications, but I think we can deal with this here. Um, and then Another question uh, was from the technology presented for producing sustainable aviation fuels. Which of them is expected to have the most uh, cost reductions and uh, should be uh, focused? Or what would be the, the particular focus that I guess of technology uh, priority in this, in this respect, according to our analysis? And then uh, lately, uh, or, or last as well, uh, if ammonia is a viable option for aviation, so perhaps some uh, our views or uh, uh, research that we might have been exposed to would be also useful for the for the audience. So I think here uh, our colleague Praveen from the supply side uh, can provide some good um, clarifications and we can um, also complement. Thanks, Araceli. So going to the first question, talking about is CCS the best use of the carbon available from the biomass? So in the near term, CCS capturing CO2 from the biofuel processes will be cheaper than what you would imagine is adding hydrogen to some of these biofuel processes in order to get a more useful, to get a uh, longer hydrocarbon chain from these biofuels. So with biofuel processes such as ethanol, but also this biomass to liquids, they produce a fairly uh, high purity stream of CO2. So when we're looking at that, it's actually quite cheap to capture it compared to something like from uh, coal power plants or natural gas power plants and very much cheaper than capturing it from the air. So in the near term, I would say using CCS from biomass and using it 
uh, and providing negative emissions is the best use at the best cost for, for using that carbon. And then as we go further towards net zero and other technologies such as this hydrogen enhanced biofuel production become deployed and more viable, we can look further into that route. But currently we don't actually include that type of technology in our modeling since it's deemed too low of a technology readiness level. And I know there's another question about using hydrogen uh, enhancement for biofuel production. And then for the second question, looking at the, the uh, cost reduction potentials for different sustainable aviation fuels. So in our modeling, we have several different sustainable aviation fuels. So on the biofuel side, we have HIFA jet, so this hydro hydrogenated vegetable oil, um, HIFA, and that is commercially produced today. So it has the lowest little to no possibility of reducing costs. So it's it's seen as one of the first biojet fuels that will be taken up taken up by the aviation sector. The other biofuel that we're looking at is biomass to liquids, both with and without carbon capture. And in this case, since it is just currently at a demonstration level and has some of the first commercial plants in the pipeline, there is a large potential to reduce the capital costs on this technology. But like with many biofuel technologies, feedstocks do make up a large portion of the total levelized cost. So by 2050, feedstocks could account for anywhere between 50% and 70% of the total levelized cost. So if we're looking just at CapEx, the ability to reduce that cost is still limited. And then finally on synfuels, which uses a power to liquids method, which combines CO2 and hydrogen using fissure tropes, since there are that technology, that fuel relies on two technologies that need to reach commercial deployment, both electrolytic hydrogen and direct air capture, for example. There are great, there's great potential to reduce that cost. But as it's currently the highest fuel, uh, the highest cost, it will remain the highest cost fuel in the future. So both biofuels, biojet fuels, and sim fuels. In going into the future, they, they will still be too high compared to their fossil fuel counterparts. So there will need to be a carbon price in order to bring it into cost parity with fossil fuels. And in terms of trying to choose one or the other, I would say given the challenge of decarbonizing aviation, we really do need to look at a multiple, multiple types of alternative fuels. So it would be best to develop both of these in coordination and parallel. And for the uh, whether or not ammonia is a viable option for aviation, uh, we have not included this as an option in our modeling, as it seems like there, there may be some early research potentially coming out of Oxford that looks at looking at ammonia for aviation. But since this is very, very new, we haven't included it in our modeling, again, since it's too, too new of an idea at this point. Thanks very much, Praveen. Very, very useful. Um, I'm just seeing that we are kind of running out of time and there's uh, quite some questions uh, still particularly on the supply side, but um, I thought there's one that, um, yeah, I mean, it's more on the, um, some of the conventions and the scope that we've used that would be good to clarify. It. Um, and uh, I think after this one, uh, what I think perhaps we could do is to wrap up the session and then uh, we'll uh, we have all these questions compiled, so we can get back to the colleagues that raised questions uh, on this area that couldn't be addressed uh, in the time that we have. Um, so this question uh, was on again regarding our uh, kind of methods. So whether the IA modeling we took into account uh, climate change and ecological degradation impacts, uh, for example, on agricultural yields for biofuels production. Um, so perhaps uh, if Praveen, you could uh, kind of clarify this to the two colleagues, then uh, we'll close the, the meeting after this. Definitely. Thank, thanks again for that question. So when we look at how much biomass we're using in our model, we, we rely on estimates of sustainable supply from literature. So looking at the literature, there is a general consensus that around 100 exajoules of biomass up to about 200 exajoules could reasonably use and be used and produced in a sustainable manner. And so in our modeling, we set an upper limit of 125 exajoules to try to maintain a sustainable supply. So while we, we don't 
look at the kind of immediate impacts and we don't model these other types of climate change, biodiversity impacts, or ecological degradation impacts, it is something we do try to reflect when we set the, the total limit for our biofuels, our biomass potential. And going forward, we move away from typically first generation biofuels such as uh, crops like, eth um, like corn or sugarcane and move towards second generation. So energy crops that do not compete with food supply as well as focusing on residues from the agricultural and logging industry and looking at uh, any other kind of waste potentials, for example, waste oils to use for, for HEPA, HBO and things. Excellent. Well, many thanks, Praveen. Um, so, well, uh, with this, uh, we're just going to close the, the session now. I'd like to, to thank all participants. We had uh, quite a lot of registrations, uh, more than 250, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, there's been quite a good uh, participation all the way through the, the session. So that's very good. And uh, we are thankful for, again, the inputs you provided to our work, but also for taking the time to join uh, this session and go um, deeper into the details and be part of the discussion. Um, we are going to be getting back to you uh, with this, I mean, addressing the questions that couldn't be uh, addressed in the time that we had. And I uh, just wanted to, to thank as well the whole uh, transport team in the technology division, which has been uh, tremendous and uh, work uh, to bring this uh, to the publication phase. So, Jacopo Titter, Jacopo Tatini, Leonardo Paoli, Marion Corner, Ekta uh, Vibra, Elizabeth Connelli, but also uh, colleagues from the supply team that help, um, as you could hear as well, Pravin uh, Baines and Jose Bermuda. So thanks to all of you, uh, very well done. And, uh, and yeah, thanks everyone participating. We'll be in touch uh, addressing the remaining questions, as I've mentioned. And slides, as well as the recording of the presentation will be also made available. So thanks again and uh, have a nice evening. Bye-bye.